something. So what is the truth about our life? What is the truth about this universe? What is the truth about myself? What is the truth about God? These three entities comprise our life. Jiva, Jagat and Ishwara, individual, the world in front of me, Ishwara, the creator. So we inquire. What's the truth of myself? What's the truth of the universe? What's the truth of Ishwara? At some point in time, this kind of a desire arises in a human being. Desire to know. When a person lives what we may call intelligently, there is an intelligent way of living. As human beings, we are self-conscious beings and we also are blessed with a faculty of choice that we can make our own choices. What to do, what not to do, how to do. This is a unique gift that only a human being has. No other creatures have this gift of choosing what to do. As far as they are concerned, the life is, it appears to be programmed and therefore what they should do is determined not deliberately by them but by their instinct. So the rest of the nature lives an instinctive life. The instinct is built into them and therefore they behave in a programmed manner. Therefore their behavior is predictive. We can predict how nature will behave. 
And that's why you can even predict when there is going to, what the evening weather is going to be, what's going to happen this weekend, etc., etc. In case our predictions do not come out right, it shows a limitation of our knowledge. But that, that, there is an order, or the rule according to which the whole nature functions. Except human being who has the freedom of choice, and therefore he has the freedom not to follow that order. So, therefore, human being has the responsibility for his or her own growth. The growth takes place at different levels. One is the growth taking place at the physiological level. And that takes place according to the laws of nature. And so, we don't have to do much about the growth of the physical body. But then we have a mind, an emotional faculty, an intellectual faculty, and particularly the emotional, the intellectual faculty grows by exposing ourselves to the teaching in the schools and colleges and universities, etc. And the emotional growth has to take place in a different way. Emotional growth will not take place merely by knowing things, but by doing things in a certain way. Therefore, Bhagavad Gita prescribes Karma Yoga. What is Karma Yoga? Performing Karma or our daily duties with a certain attitude. Now as human beings, we have freedom to choose what attitude to entertain. While doing something, I have the choice to do that for my personal agenda or a self-centered agenda, I may do something. It is possible for me to have an have other centered agenda also. So I have the freedom to perform a self-centered action or a selfless action. That choice a human being has. It is that choice which enables him to grow. This kind of a choice other creatures do not have. They do not perform what we call deliberate actions. Their actions are instinctively performed and only meant for essentially themselves. How to survive, how to propagate their species, etc. But in so doing, they do not violate the prevailing order. But the human being, in order to secure his own welfare, it is possible that he may violate the welfare of others. Therefore, scriptures prescribe a way of life as to how you can help yourself without hurting others. Or you can help yourself while helping others, even better than that is, how you can help yourself by helping others. So this attitude of helping others, securing one's own growth, helping oneself through helping others is the attitude which we can call yoga. So karma yoga is karma or action performed with the attitude of yoga. What is the attitude? What our Swamiji would call the attitude of a contributor. How I can contribute and then be contributed. How I can help myself by helping others. How I can secure happiness for myself by imparting happiness to others. So this is a way of life, we may call it intelligent way of living. Why intelligent? Because I help myself by living or by entertaining this kind of attitude. When a person does this, then slowly the mind becomes mature. What is meant by maturity of mind is the mind becomes more and more tranquil, more and more thinking, more and more contemplative, 
more and more inward looking. As the mind becomes <coughs> mature, or as the mind becomes purified, our perception changes. The mind and the soul is made up of three gunas, sattva, rajas and tamas. When the mind is dominated by tamas, tamoguna, which stands for darkness and dullness, then the mind is dark, cannot understand, cannot grasp things. And it has negative feelings such as anger, such as jealousy, such as hatred, etc. When the mind has predominance of rajas, then also its perception is somewhat distorted. And he looks upon the universe as a place of enjoyment. When the mind becomes sattvic, the same universe now invites him to know that arises in his mind the desire to know how the universe functions. That's how the scientists are incurious to know how the things function. They are not interested in any bhoga or any pleasure, they are interested in knowledge. So in the mind, predominance of rajas, that is the attitude of bhoga or seeking pleasure. And the mind with predominant sasattva, there is this, this desire to know. So this desire for knowledge as to what is the truth or what is the essence about the universe? What is the essence of the truth of myself? Is there a creator? How has the universe come into being? All these kind of questions arise when the mind becomes sattvic. <clears throat> so, tattva bodha. Tattva bodha means knowledge of tattva, knowledge of the truth. As it is, the truth of all these three, all these three happens to be one. Even though there are three entities, the individual, the universe that I confront and the creator of the universe, Jiva, Jagat and Ishvara. But the truth of all these three happens to be one. Meaning that it is one tattva, one truth, which manifests as the individual, manifests as the universe, even manifests as Ishvara, the creator. That is basically what Vedanta teaches. The, the unity behind the diversity. That at the superficial level there is this variety and diversity and disparity. They said on the, in, the, on the ocean also, the surface level, there are many waves and foam and the bubbles. But all of them spring from water. All of them are sustained by water, all of them merge back into water. And so water is the truth of the waves and bubbles and foam. And so also one consciousness, one Satchidananda. It is say, called by different words, sometimes we call it Brahman, Atman, Atma, God. That is the essence of the individual, of the universe, and also of God or Ishwara. <coughs> so this is what this text Tattva Buddha does. Therefore, here we find a contemplation upon the nature of this three. First, it begins with a contemplation upon the nature of the self begins with the individual. Atma kaha. The individual self is called Atma. Atma kaha. What is the nature of Atma? It asks this question. The text is composed in a question answer format. The question is asked by a shishya or a disciple. And the answer is given by Guru or the preceptor. 
We do not know who the disciple is and who the teacher is, but we have the questions and answers. So at one point, the student asks, Atma Kaha, Sir, what's the nature of the self? Then, Satchidananda. So, page 12, the very first line. It says, Atma Kaha, means what? What? Who am I? What's the nature of the self? Atma ka. What's the nature of the self? And then the answer is given. Sthula, Sukshma, Karana, Sairat, Vyatarikta, Panchakosha, Tita, Avastatra, Sakshi, San, Satchidana, Sarupa, San, Yes, Tishthadi, so Atma. What's the nature of self? What's the nature of consciousness, you may say? What's the nature of self? Sthula, Sukshma, Karana, Sairat, Vyatrikta. So, what's the nature of I? Atma means I. Why is it necessary to ask this question, who am I? Because when we use the pronoun I, we mix up a lot of things over and above the I. I means I, capital I. Not E-Y-E-I, but capital I. So when we use the pronoun I for ourselves, not only, of course, we have the real I included in that, but along with that we also include this body, sense organs, the mind, which are not really self, are also included in the self. This is what is done, we do habitually. Nobody has told us to do that. But by habit, which is beginningless, we are identifying with what the Atma is not, the body is not the Atma, Sense organs are not the Atma, not I. The mind is not the I. Why is it so? Because the I is the witness. I is a seer, witness, illuminator. And the body, sense organs, mind, all of that illumined, seen, objectified. Atma is the subject. I means the subject. But in the subject, we are also including what is not subject. This gross body is not the subject. The mind is not the subject. Sense organs are not the subject. But by habit, by because of ignorance, we are lumping all of them together and that complex entity which is made up of the real I plus what is not I, that is all taken to be I and the subject. Like seeing an actor with a costume of a beggar on the stage and one may take that entity to be a beggar. Now, a beggar who is on the stage, there are two aspects. One is the real aspect, other is the incidental aspect, unreal aspect. The actor is real, whereas the costume is unreal. Actor is real, 
the beggar is unreal because it's not the because actor is independent beggar is dependent remove the actor from the beggar nobody remains remove the beggar from the actor still the actor remains so actor is the truth the beggar is the actor is reality beggar is the unreality actor is atma the beggar is the costume is anatma costume is anatma Similarly, here also there is a combination of the self and the costume. What is the costume? This, this, that's what is described here. Sthula, Sukshma, Karana, Sharirat, Vyatarikta. You understand that the I is Vyatarikta, distinct from Sthula. is telling us the sthul sharira sukshm sharira karan sharira sharira means body sthul means gross sukshm means subtle karan means causal understand that the gross body the subtle body the causal body is not the atma you are mistaking those things to be yourself you are not this gross body is not you even though when we think of i automatically the body is included and therefore the body when i look at the body i never feel that i am looking at somebody else when i'm looking at you i'm quite clear that i'm looking at somebody other than myself when i look at this body what's the kind what's the kind of response there is i'm looking at myself so this body is taken to be myself but then the reality is body is not myself because as clearly as i see you so clearly i see this body as clearly i am aware of you so clearly or more clearly i am aware of the body is not so so within our soul there is someone who says who, who is aware of the body i am the aware of the body body is the object of awareness is it clear body is something that we are aware of we are conscious of just here i am conscious of this part conscious of this cloth clock conscious of the cloth so so i am conscious of this gross body therefore gross body is not i is go viveka viveka means to separate separating the i from what is not i because of ignorance we have jumped together the i and non i the subject and object the atma and anatma and therefore we have a false notion or false understanding of our own self so i take myself to be a man or a woman tall or short fair or dark bright or dull or whatever i take myself to be in all those conclusions not only i is involved but this non i also is mixed up in it and that complexity is what is the cause of all our unhappiness in life vedan the explains that the only cause of sadness or unhappiness 
is because I take this non-self to be myself. And therefore, I have, as a result, I have a wrong perception of myself. If I had the right perception of myself, if I knew truly what I am, there is no occasion whatever or no scope of any sorrow or unhappiness. Swamiji, but will physical pain go away? Physical pain may not go away. Meaning that the wise person who has a clear knowledge of self also may have to go through physical pain if the destiny so brings it. But physical pain is not samsara. It is emotional pain that is samsara. If you are clear that the body is my costume, then those aches and pains etc. you may have to suffer. But that will not cause a sense of hopelessness, a sense of fear, a sense of uh, uh, helplessness. Well, I know that the pain is taking place, not in I, it is taking place in the body. It is true that I have a special relationship with this body. I don't have that relationship with any other body. And therefore, what happens in this body will affect me more than anything else. Or will be experienced by me more intimately. But that need not affect me. Right now, when something happens to the body, I say, it is happening to me. And therefore, I become very scared. Or I become afraid. Or I become unhappy. I become sad. So we are told, Atma or you or the subject is distinct from the gross, subtle and causal body. Stula, Sukshma, Karana, Sharirat, Vyatirikta, Panchakosha, Tita. Another way of looking upon Anatma or non self is Panchakosha. This costume can be divided into three bodies or can also be divided into five sheets. Like in winter we have so many sheets, you know. There is a shirt also and a sweater also and some jacket also and overcoat also and all kinds of things are there. Similarly as though there are so many sheets of the Atma. Annamaya kosha, pranamaya kosha, manomaya kosha, vijnanamaya kosha, anandamaya kosha. The sheath that is made up of the modification of food. The sheath made up of modification of the prana, the vital air. The sheath made up of modification of mind. The sheath made up of modification of intellect. The sheath made up of modification of happiness. You are none of these koshas, you are none of the sheets. They are covering the all right, they are not you. Avasthatra Sakshi. Who are you? You are Sakshi, you are witness. Witness of what? Avastha Tre Sakshi. We every day go through these three kinds of experiences. One is called waking, other is called the dream, third is called the deep sleep. Waking, dream and deep sleep. They are called Avasthat, the states, states of the mind. Sometimes they call it states of consciousness or the states of mind. Waking, dream, deep sleep. So normally, I entertain a notion that 
I am a waker, I am a dreamer, when I am dream or I am a sleeper. So because of identification of the mind, we entertain these notions, I am a waker, I am a dreamer, I am a sleeper. These three states, waking, dream, deep sleep, whom do they belong to? The waking belongs to what? Belongs to the mind. So who is awake? The mind is awake. Who is dreaming? The mind is dreaming. Who is sleeping? The mind is sleeping. If that is clear to us, then I know that waking, dreaming, sleep are not my states. That is states of the mind. But because of identification of the mind, we take for granted, I am a waker, I am a dreamer, I am a sleeper. These conclusions arising from identification with this costume are creating all sorts of emotional problems. <coughs> Therefore, the only way to become free from unhappiness in life or sadness in life is to know the Atma, know the Self as truly the Self is. So if you are not the body, not the gross body, not the subtle body, not the causal body, you are not Tyandamaya, Pranamaya, Manumaya, Vijnanamaya, Ayandamaya, you are not one of these koshas or sheets. You are not a waker, not a dreamer, not a leaf shooter. Then who are you? Says Satchidananda Swarupa San. Who am I? Satchidananda Swarupa. What is the essential aspect of I? <coughs> so now we have, I see that in I also there are two elements. One element is changing, other element does not change. Just as in the actor, now the actor appears as a beggar. In some other play, he may appear as a king. In the third play, he may appear as a minister. And thus you may take different roles. So while the actor assumes different roles, there also there are two aspects. One is the changing or incidental aspect, other is the changeless or the essential aspect. In all these different roles, the actor is the changeless essential aspect. Where is the beggar, the king, the minister? whatever, so they keep on changing. Is it not so? <coughs> so rule is that whatever is changeless is essential, is the nature of truth. Whatever is changing is incidental. So beggar is there now, not there when the king is there. King is there now, not there when the minister is there. And so when one role comes, the other role is displaced. But neither the beggar, nor the king, nor the minister, none of them displace the actor. See that? When the king comes, the beggar is gone. They are mutually exclusive, meaning when one is there, other cannot be. When the minister comes, the king also is gone, beggar also is gone. So as he takes different roles, other roles are all displaced, correct? But none of these roles can displace whom? Cannot displace the actor. Because without the actor, role cannot be. It is not that actor is there because of role. It is that role is because of actor. In the beggar, there is one aspect that is real, essential, changeless. Is that other aspect is unreal, incidental, changing. To separate the two in our mind, to know the actor as actor, it is not necessary that actor has to remove his costume for us to know, recognize him. 
But even when the actor puts on the costume of a beggar, his essential features cannot change. He can have as a beggar some beard and some, you know, uh, disabled hair he may have, beggar, he may have a beard, he may have all kinds of rags as clothes, all of this can be there. <coughs> but his eyes cannot change. His nose cannot change, lips cannot change. If you are sharp enough and smart enough to recognize a person from the eyes or from the shape of the nose, then you will recognize the actor regardless of what costume he wears. Is it not so? Similarly, the eye keeps on wearing different costumes. For example, right now I am speaking and I call myself a speaker. But when can I be really called a speaker, you know? If I keep on speaking and speaking, then only I can be called speaker. But now I am a speaker, a little later I will become a listener. A little later, I will become a driver. So, speaker, listener, driver, eater, walker, talker, all of these are the incidental aspects of I, changing aspects of I, the costumes of I. What is it that does not change through all these changes? I am a speaker. I am a listener, I am a walker, I am a jogger, etc. In all of them, the speaker, the listener, the walker, the jogger, they keep changing, but I am, I am, I am, I am, doesn't change. Isn't it so? And that I am a self-revealing. Meaning that I always know that I am. You can sometime try this meditation. I am not. Try that meditation. I am not. Don't try that because you <laughs> cannot meditate. For, for me even to say I am not, I must be there to say that I am not. Is it not so? For me to think that I am not, the I must be there. So it can never be that I am is not. You understand? It can never be that I am is ever not there. I am is ever there. Even when I am sleeping, even the sense of individual I is not there, the I am is shining constantly in the waking, dream, deep sleep. If I am not shining in deep sleep, I cannot wake up. The I is non-existence in deep sleep. Then I can't wake up because I was not there in deep sleep. But I wake up because I am very much there in the deep sleep also. So what is the nature of that I, essential I? Satchidananda. So Satchidananda. What is Satchidananda? the questions are asked. <coughs> Page 25. In the middle, there is this sentence, Atma Tarehi Kaha. What is he? Then, who am I? What's the nature of Atma? What's the nature of Self? What's the nature of I? Answer is given, Satchidananda Swarupa. The nature of I is Satchidananda. Sat means existence. Chit means consciousness. 
Ananda means fullness or happiness. So what is my true essential nature? What is the essential nature of the self? Is existence, awareness, wholeness, completeness. So it's only only mean by sat. Sat chit ananda. It means of three words, sat, chit and ananda. What is sat? Says Kalatrevi Tishthati Di Sada. On the page 26, the answer is given. Kalatrevi Tishthati. 26 page, not 25. 26 is on the right side. Or unless you have a different book. Okay, all right. So, Then the question is, Sat Kim? What is the nature of Sat? What is Sat? What is existence? Answer is given, Kalatrepi Tishthati Di Sat. That which stays or remains in all three periods of time is Sat or existence. Existence is my nature. To be is my nature. And this existence or to be Kalatrepi Tishthati it stays, remains in all three periods of time. Past, present and future. Waking, dream and deep sleep. When the waking is there, dream is not there. When dream is there, waking is not there. When sleep is there, waking and dream are not there. They displace each other. But even this three stage do not displace the I. I am the waker. I am the dreamer. I am the sleeper. The I am, I am, I am remains unchanging. So what is the true nature of myself? That which is unchanging. That is it does not change. Which is essential. I am, I am. So what is existence? I am. To be. Am is the form of to be. You know that? The verb is to be. The first person singular is am. I am. Second person is you are. Third person is he is or she is. So this to be keeps changing, you know. I am. You can't say you am, you are. See, you can't say she am or he am, he is. She is. But suppose you could say that. I am, you am, he is, he am, she am, <coughs> am, or is, or are, is, it means existence, to be. There are the forms of to be. What's a verb? To be is a verb. To be is a verb. Anyway, so sat kim, sat means existence. Meaning that, what is my nature? That I ever am. I always is. It can never be that I am not. Next question <coughs> is asked. Chit kim. You ask my Chidananda. Then, Chit kim, what's the nature of Chit? What is Sat? Existence. Kalatre Vitishthadi, that which remains in all three periods of time. Chitkam, so what's the nature of chit or consciousness? Says Jnana Surupaha, it is of the form of undifferentiated knowledge. Sometimes we use the word knowledge, sometimes consciousness, sometimes awareness. They all amount to the same thing. All of these words have their meaning in our day-to-day -day use of the language. But therefore, we have to understand the meaning in which they are used here in this context. 
So when we use the word knowledge, we use the word for a qualified knowledge. Knowledge of physics, knowledge of chemistry, knowledge of parts, knowledge of cloth, knowledge of form, etc. But there also there are two aspects involved. One is knowledge of, so knowledge of part, knowledge of cloth, knowledge of clock. That part and clock and cloth and things are all changing, but knowledge of knowledge remains unchanged. So knowledge of part is qualified, part knowledge is qualified knowledge, qualified by partness. Cloth knowledge is qualified knowledge, qualified by clockness. Clock knowledge is qualified knowledge, qualified by clockness. Knowledge is said what? Unqualified knowledge. Unqualified existence, unqualified knowledge, <clears throat> which is common to all knowledges. See, to give an example, like there is gold from which you make a number of ornaments. Every ornament is a qualified state of gold. Every ornament is a qualified state of gold. Bangle is a qualified state of gold. Earring is a qualified state of gold. Nose ring is a qualified state of gold. A bracelet, a necklace, an anklet, whatever. All of these are different from each other in one aspect, but not different in another aspect. In the qualified aspect, they're all different from each other. A bangle is a bangle, and a bracelet is a bracelet, and a necklace is a necklace. But what is the unqualified aspect of them? Is gold, in which aspect they are all the same. So it is a universal aspect or unqualified aspect that assumes qualifications. And that's how distinctions are created. But in all the distinctions, in all the variety, there is a unity. Similarly, in all different forms of knowledge, there is a universal knowledge, unqualified knowledge, that is called awareness or consciousness. And there is I, unqualified existence is I, unqualified knowledge or consciousness is I. Then the third question is, Ananda kaha. What is Ananda? Sis Sukha Swarupaha. Ananda means happiness. So we can call it happiness, wholeness, fullness. Happiness is where limitlessness is, that is where happiness is. Happiness cannot be in anything that is limited. Upanishad explains in one place. Yovai bhuma tat sukham. So that which is bhuma, limitless, that is what happiness is. Nalpe sukhamasti, in anything limited, there cannot be happiness. All the objects that we come across are all limited. Therefore they cannot contain, they cannot have happiness. Even though when we experience a desirable object, we do feel happy. So eating an ice cream cake, for example, you know, ice cream cake, or cake, an ice cream cake, wow. And one layer is vanilla, other layer is pistachio, third layer is cherry, fourth layer is raspberry, whatever. With nuts in between. So when you, when you eat that, experience that, there is happiness. It looks as though the happiness has come from that ice cream. But you know, when I'm enjoying ice cream, then really what is happening is I'm enjoying myself, really. The ice cream facilitates my enjoyment of myself. Understand this. Ice cream does not give me happiness. 
price screen, happiness is only in one place. Where is it? In the self, in the consciousness. But normally, because we are always looking outward, therefore we are not able to enjoy the happiness which is our own self. If the mind became inward looking, then the mind can enjoy the happiness which is the self. But mind is generally outward looking, extroward, always searching for happiness elsewhere. In that very search of happiness elsewhere, it is deprived of the happiness of the self. So when a desirable object such as ice cream come before, comes before me, at that time when I put ice cream, you know, a spoonful of ice cream on my palate, at that time my mind becomes completely dissolved in that experience. Mm -hmm. And that is how the ananda or happiness, which is nature of consciousness, becomes evident. And thus the ice cream facilitates the enjoyment of my own self. So when you look at the mountain, oh how beautiful when you look at the mountain, green mountain, or particularly in the fall, when the trees have different colors, so one mountain may have nine different color shades, red and orange and yellow and whatever, and you just, you just get lost. But when we get lost, what happens? We come to ourselves. The mind which was looking out completely gets dissolved and comes to myself. And thus that mountain facilitates my enjoyment of myself. From now on, you can meditate like this. You are enjoying your co cup of coffee. Mm -hmm. You are sipping your coffee and are enjoying it. That time, you can remind yourself, I am enjoying myself. You look at the flower and say, the flower is beautiful. At that time, you can say that, the eye is beautiful. What the flower does is only facilitates me to enjoy the beauty which is my nature. Beauty is the nature of the self. Happiness is the nature of the self. Love is the nature of happiness of the self. So when you enjoy love of somebody, you can always remind yourself, I am enjoying myself who is of the nature of love. When you enjoy happiness, you can remind yourself. So at that time, we experience ourselves. And the experience may not be totally profound, because, but still we are pretty close to ourselves. Sometimes there are moments when we completely lose ourselves, that we are ecstatic. All the time we are not ecstatic. We are happy but not ecstatic. But when the last stroke is played, the game between Toronto and Boston, and Toronto won, at that moment you will see the audience, last 24.5 seconds remaining now, and they are jostling. And Toronto managed to while away at that time, and Boston had no opportunity to score a goal in that, and Toronto won. <laughs> At that, everybody is ecstatic, you get lost. In that moment of ecstasy, we are totally, when we forget ourselves. At that time, that moment, you forget where you are, who you are. You have no awareness of time at that time or place. A person who may be normally very reserved, who may not say anything, you know, always keep things to himself or herself, very reserved. In a moment like that, you know, screams, shout, you know, all reservation goes away at that moment. What happens? The person becomes free totally and is a real self. At that time, I am experiencing 
in that moment of bliss, I am experiencing myself. So when you are enjoying the beauty, sometimes things are so beautiful that you get lost in the beauty. Sometimes the flower is so beautiful. Or there are snow flurries and you just sometimes, it's so much, when you never expected them. If you expect them in winter, it's all right, but when it comes in spring, you know, when the snow flurries are so, and you are in your room, of course. And watching through the glass window. <laughs> At that time, it's a beautiful scenery. And then the snow piles up and then it assumes the forms of the trees and the, and the branches and all the different objects and everything is covered with white. It's a heavenly atmosphere. We sometimes get lost in that. When we get lost, we are totally with ourselves. The mind is a resort. That mind itself is an obstacle. It comes in the way of myself and myself. That mind creates in me a sense of individuality. And the extent to which the mind gets resolved, to that extent, the sense of individuality also gets resolved. And to that extent, I am closer to myself. And to that extent, there is a greater intensity of happiness. See, when we experience a desirable object, we are not always the same intensity of happiness. You are happy, but Swamiji, that time, uh, the samosa was different, you know. <laughs> so, every time, the intensity is not the same, because the mind has not totally resolved. The mind still retains itself and so the sense of individuality still remains and that is what is an obstacle to being myself. I am not totally myself. We are rarely ourselves really. <laughs> As we are right now, all of us are having a facade, having a, a you know, and so we always have a facade. We want to appear to the world in a certain way. I want you to look at me in a certain way and I want you to have a certain impression of myself and not other than what I want you. That's why I dress myself in a certain way. I shave my head in a way. I do all of that. But rarely I am myself. We are generally in very uh, un hanging unnatural states. Because of various notions of the mind, because of various insecurities various fears, various complexes. Poor human being is in such a pitiable condition, suffers from so many complexes that I'm not fair enough, I'm not tall enough, I'm not beautiful enough, I'm not lean enough, I'm not this enough, I'm not that enough, constantly suffering from a sense of not enough or inadequacy, from different ways. Body-wise inadequate, mind-wise inadequate, intellect-wise inadequate, wisdom-wise inadequate, smartness-wise inadequate, success-wise inadequate, memory-wise inadequate. <laughs> All the time. Feel and then I want to appear adequate, you see. <laughs> so thus, I ever rarely present myself as I am. That is why we feel very comfortable in the presence of wise people. Because they don't have a facade. There's a natural self. And there is a beautiful self. The natural self happens to you. You see, what we want is what we are covering, unfortunately. We want to enjoy beauty, which is very much ourselves. But then what we are doing because of the complexes, we are covering that very beauty and seeking it where it is not. Happiness is of nature, and we want happiness, but we cover that happiness and then look where it is not. It's a very unfortunate, sad situation, but that's, that's called samsara, that's the situation of human beings. That is why we require some powerful experience. An ordinary experience will not, uh, will not shake me. I still retain my individuality. As much as possible I try, so that I am not exposed and so that I, I retain my control. 
But sometimes some experience happens and I lose myself. <coughs> At that time, if you take my picture, I won't pose. Right now, otherwise I'll pose in a certain way. If you take my picture, all is pose. But when I'm in that moment, I see no need to pose also. In the deep sleep stage is a similar state. Similar means, you know, that you're lost. State of deep sleep, you get lost. There's no complex at that time. And then at that time, if you take my picture, I won't pour. I, mean, I, I, I you know, I'll appear what I really am, I guess, whatever. No facade. No complex. The eye is completely resolved. The mind is resolved. And the mind which maintains the sense of individuality is resolved. Therefore, there is total freedom. Moment I wake up, all the baggage and I, I cook in my head, you know, all the baggage I pick up. And all with all that baggage I move about for the whole day in my waking hours. And I think that I need that baggage to protect myself. This baggage I am holding on to to feel security. Not realizing that baggage makes me insecure. So Vedanta simply wants to bring us to our natural state, that's all. Yesterday someone was asking a question, what is moksha? Just to be yourself, that's all. But because of ignorance, because of complexes, we are not ourselves. What is, so in a moment of ecstasy, when that I gets resolved, the individual I gets resolved, the mind gets resolved, you become yourself and you experience yourself. Moment again something happens and all the complexes come back, then again, you know, I'm back to where my unnatural state. <clears throat> so, anandakkaha, sukha swarupaha, of the nature of happiness. Evam Sachidananda Rupam Swatmanam Vijaniya. Thus, you should know the self as Sachidananda Swarupa Sat Chit Ananda. Existence, awareness, happiness, wholeness. You call it wholeness, happiness, fullness, beauty, whatever you want, love, all different names. So, love also is the same thing. That's why bhakti uses that aspect. Atma is love, so bhakti works on that. Atma is knowledge, Vedanta works on that, you know. Anyway, <clears throat> so this is what the Tomada is teaching. And we'll, tomorrow, we'll continue from this end. Somebody should tell me tomorrow where, how far we came last year, okay? Page 27. Hmm? Page 27. Page 27, that's where we are. Again, every year we are at that page only. <laughs> so page 27? Okay. So we concluded today at page 27, remember? I I wrote a card, but I wrote last year, 2012. No, last year I didn't write, but I wrote a card. <laughs> 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 11, I also didn't. Where we are now, we are on finish 2011 May. That's what I wrote. So, last year I did not write it. So I don't know. But we have written it 2011. We have written it 2012. Where is it? Okay. So anyway, nobody remembers, so we can start from anywhere. Mahindra Pani, Mahindra Pani, 27. We ended at page 27 last May. Okay. So tomorrow, which day? Today we can put it at 27. So we'll continue from there. Refresh us on it. Om Purnamada Purnamida Purnat Purnamudachade Purnasya Purnamadaya Purnameva Vashishyade Om Shanti 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 Shankaram Shankaracharyam 
केशवं बालरायणं सूत्रभाष्यकृतौ वन्दे भगवन्तौ पुनः पुनः ईश्वरो गुरुरात्मेदि मूर्ति भेद विभागिने व्योमवद्व्याप्त देहाय दक्षिणा 